getting it in the ear. One of the more interesting things that can happen to an angler is to get a barbed hook sunk into his hide. Such is the horror and fascination of the experience that many an angler has contemplated, giving up his regular work and hitting the lecture circuit to entertain audiences around the nation with a dramatic rendering of his ordeal. Listening to someone tell of being hooked can be a trying experience. Often I often have I observed a group of my friends listening to a fellow angler relate the grisly details of the extraction of a barbed hook from some valued and sensitive part of his anatomy. I can testify to the looks of disbelief, horror, and revulsion, the gasps and groans. The listeners, on the other hand, are usually born stiff. Sport fishing has now been in vogue for several hundred years, during which time the removal of barbed fish hooks from the hides of humans has acquired its own history. During the early days, when the Lord of the Manor hooked himself, he would select one of his serfs to remove the hook. Generally speaking, serfs did not look upon this as a plumb assignment. The <laughs> serf would grasp the shank of the hook brace both his feet on the Lord and pull for all he was worth. The method was simple and direct, but raised the mortality rate of serfs significantly. Sometimes two or three serfs would be expended in the removal of a single hook. The 20th century finally arrived with its own advances in medicine and technology, and just in time too, because the supply of serfs had been pretty well exhausted. Fishing partners could now remove hooks from each other right on the lake or stream thanks to a new invention, rusty pliers. The oh. technique consisted of grasping the shank of the hook with the pliers, bracing both feet on the hooky, and pulling. The pliers did away with much of the discomfort the extractor of the hook formerly suffered from finger cramps. The invention of earplugs also reduced the threat of hearing loss that formerly accompanied the hook removal process. Then, a man known only as Earl devised a procedure for removing hooks that appeared promising. Earl advised twisting the hook in such a manner that the point and the barb were forced up through the skin of the angler. The barb could then be clipped off and the rest of the hook easily removed. He demonstrated this technique on a burly young man by the name of Bubba and narrowly escaped with his life. Earl now lives in a different town under an assumed identity. His technique, however, became widely accepted among anglers. It can be safely applied with nothing more than a pair of rusty pliers, a stout chair, and depending on the size of the hooked angler, 10 to 15 feet of good rope. Getting hooked invariably leads to an, ins to an instant social occasion. The reason for this is that one's fishing partners feel that an audience for the hook removal will inhibit the hooky from extreme emotional outbursts. Even as great chunks of his flesh are gouged out of him, great chunks, meaning any the size of a pinhead or larger, the angler will stoically sit there telling jokes. Then there was the one about the chicken and the turtle, ow! And so anyway, the rabbit is, ow! Well, the farmer comes home right then and, ow! That is why as soon as someone is hooked, one of his companions must leap to his feet and announce to all the fishermen within a quarter mile, hey, we got a man hooked here. It so happens that every fisherman ever born has developed his own theory for hook removal. Here now is his chance to test the theory on someone besides himself. <laughs> Upon the announcement that a man has been hooked, all boats on a lake will immediately converge on the scene of the disaster. If the hooking occurs on a stream, 
Men, women, and children will come running from all directions, some charging right through boiling rapids in their efforts to arrive in time and foist off their theory on the attending surgeon, usually a man known only as Earl. There is a good deal of pushing and shoving as the assembled anglers struggle with each other to get their hands on the offending hook and test their particular theory. Everyone is shouting opinions and recommending techniques. Best way to do that, twist and pull real hard, take a sharp knife and tie a string between the hook and the anchor, and after a while, the anglers begin swapping tales about the times they got hooked and how much worse hookings they were than the one here being witnessed. Beverages and sandwiches are broken out and a full-scale party is soon underway. Hookings are to fishermen what barn raisings were to the pioneers, an opportunity for socializing in an otherwise solitary enterprise. I myself have been hooked only twice in my life. On the first occasion, Wretch Sweeney and I were fishing from a bass boat. Our motor had conked out and we were, for, and we were faced with the prospect of having to paddle the boat all the way across the lake to the launch area. The wind had come up and I was making my final cast. A gust whipped my line around me and I buried the hook in the flab of my left side. Wretch took charge, delighted to have this opportunity to test one of his many theories for hook removal. As soon as he had shouted out the requisite, hey, we have a man hooked here, even though we were the only ones on the lake, he cut away my shirt, pleased with the chance to use his new knife, grabbed a pair of rusty pliers, and began worrying the hook although a good deal less than me. Frustrated in his effort, he fell back on the traditional tactic of bracing both feet on the hooking and pulling, thereby stretching my flab out in the vague shape of a sail. The wind caught my flab like a jib and began moving us in the general direction of the launch ramp. Wretch was all for maintaining this arrangement because if the wind held and he could tack to the starboard, it would save us a good deal of paddling. I argued against it. The maneuver, however, had loosened the hook and it dropped out of its own accord. Nevertheless, I do not favor this method and cannot in good faith recommend it. On the plus side, the mishap improved my casting fourfold and 15 years passed before I hooked myself again. The second and most recent hooking occurred while I was fishing with my irascible neighbor, Alphonse P. Finley. Finley was winding up for a cast when I suddenly had the sensation that one of my ears had been turned into live bait. Apparently, unaware that he had hooked me, Finley attempted to cast my ear into a patch of lily pads and might well have succeeded if the ear had been less firmly attached to my head. I immediately called Finley's attention to the problem. Startled, he looked around. Cripes, he said, I thought Jaws 3 had taken a bite out of you. And all it is, you've got a set of treble hooks dangling from your ear. Where's my rusty pliers? I've got a surefire technique for removing hooks from ears, but first, let me say this. What? Hey, we've got a man hooked over here, he shouted. Once again, I was saved the ordeal of an audience, Finley and I being the only anglers on the lake. Forget your technique, I said. I'm having a doctor remove this hook. Now just get your clippers and snip the line from the hook. Always one for taking a bad situation and making it worse, Finley looked around for his clippers, backed up and bumped against my head, sinking one of the treble hooks all the way through his sweatshirt. My ear was now firmly attached to Finley's back just above his belt line. You'll have to take your sweatshirt off, 
I said. I can't, Finley said. The hook went through my long underwear, too. Well, if you can't pull the sweatshirt over your head, see if you can't wiggle out through the neck. Finley wiggled and squirmed, grunted and groaned. No, I can't make it, he said in a strangled voice. Now I've got my arm stuck straight up through the neck of the sweatshirt and can't get it back in. This is the worst predicament I've ever been in, I said. Somehow, we've got to get this boat back to shore. Get into your car, drive to that gas station down the road, and have the attendant cut us loose. Uh, I have some more bad news for you, Finley said. What? I've got to go to the bathroom. An hour later, we pulled into the gas station. Carefully, we eased out of the car with me cheek to cheek with Finley's backside and Finley with his arms sticking straight up out of the neck of his sweatshirt. Three old codgers tilted back in their chairs against the station watched us curiously, apparently unaccustomed to seeing strangers in those parts. Finley, no doubt, directing a strained smile at them, croaked, would one of you gentlemen be kind enough to direct me to the men's restroom? Or the ladies, for that matter, which, whichever is unoccupied at the moment. Wait, stop, I shouted. Someone cut us loose first. The codgers came over for a closer look. They had gum. I see the problem, one of them said. They's hooked together with fish hooks. At first, I thought you fellers was just from New York City. Hey, Ben, bring me them wire snippers. In a few seconds, we were snipped apart and none too soon, for Finley homed in on the men's restroom like a heat-seeking missile, while I stared after Al, contemplating the peril I'd narrowly escaped. The old codger who had snipped us apart tugged at the lure dangling from my ear. Let me have a go at the hook in your ear, he said. I got a special technique for getting hooks out of ears. Why not, I said. Okay, have at it, Mr. Mr. The old gent smiled and pulled a rusty pair of pliers from his hip pocket. You just call me Earl, he said. Garage sale hype. 98% of all hunting and fishing time is spent getting ready to go hunting and fishing. Getting ready consists primarily of buying stuff. The easiest place to buy this stuff is at a sporting goods store, which has the disadvantage of fixed prices. Often, however, you can find just what you're looking for at a garage sale, where if you don't mind haggling a bit, you can get a used item for scarcely more than you would pay for a new one. Furthermore, fish and game laws in all 50 states permit you to refer to any sporting gear bought at a garage sale as a terrific bargain. If the item proves to be defective, you can always return it to the operator of the garage sale, and he will happily return your money, but only if you can provide identification proving you are a recent escapee from a maximum security prison for the criminally insane. I myself am a skilled garage sale shopper. Whenever I'm looking for a real bargain on some outdoor gear, I buy the first edition of the Sunday newspaper, Saturday Evening. That gives me an edge on the other bargain hunters who might scan the classified ads in the later editions for the same neat stuff I'm after. Last Saturday evening, I was sitting in my study, also known as the laundry room, perusing the classified section of the Sunday paper when my irritable neighbor, Al Finley, burst in on me. Darn it, Finley, I said. Knock before you come charging into somebody's house. You startled me. Good, Finley snapped. Besides, I did knock. 
you did? I guess I didn't hear you because the washing machine was running. Anyway, when I did answer your knock, you should have realized I wasn't home and gone away. I knew, of course, that Finley had come over to borrow back some of his tools. I really wouldn't mind loaning him his tools so much if he would just take better care of them and return them promptly. I need my electric drill back. Let's go get it right now, he pleaded, tugging playfully on my ear. Okay, okay, I said. Just wait until I finish checking the ads for the garage sales. Whoa, what's this? Wretch Sweeney is holding a garage sale tomorrow. Mostly outdoor gear. Rods, reels, assorted fishing tackle, his old pump shotgun with the bent barrel, a bunch of other stuff. Let's say we beat it over to his house, or rather his garage, and jump on some bargains before the other bargain hunters show up tomorrow. That elbow! Finley has the habit of applying crude anatomical names to people he doesn't like. What would I want with any of his junk? Well, you did lose that spinning reel over the side of the boat last week. Maybe you can pick up another one at a bargain price at Wretch's garage sale. Oh, yeah? You're the one who'd better pick up another reel for me, preferably at a new price. It was you who dropped it over the side of the boat. I wasn't even fishing with you. Let's not quibble over meaningless details, I said, grabbing my jacket off the clothes hamper. We'd best go over to Wretch's garage just in case some premature shoppers scarf up all the good stuff. Much as I hate to admit it, that might not be a bad idea, Finley said. Darn right, I said. We'll take your car. It'll be better that way. Why is it better that we always take my car? It's just better. That's why. Do I constantly have to explain everything to you, Finley? Ye gads! The light was still on in Wretch's garage, and there was no sign of other bargain hunters lurking about. Wretch was arranging some of his sale items on top of his ping pong table, and another table he had made out of a sheet of plywood and a couple of sawhorses. Boxes of tattered, torn, worn, rusty, bent, battered, and broken items of outdoor gear were lined up along the walls. There were snowshoes empty shell casings, rods, reels, assorted fishing lures, a couple of landing nets, a canoe paddle, a rubber raft, three outboard motors, and a few hundred other items heaped in random piles about the garage. Wow, I said, this is quite a sale. Yeah, Wretch said, stepping back to examine the arrangement he had been working on. I figure I'll sell enough to buy that Bass boat I've been looking at. Finley snorted. You silly elbow. You think somebody's actually going to pay money for this conglomeration of dismal junk? You've got to be kidding. He poked gingerly at a rusty old tackle box. Careful with the merchandise, Finley, Wretch said. You break it, you've bought it. Aha! Uh -huh. I see you already picked up the lingo of marketing, but it's going to take a lot more than lingo to sell this detritus. Detritus? That's a tackle box. An antique tackle box. Craps, don't you even know an antique tackle box when you see one? Anyhow, it might just interest you to know, Finley that I am a master of sales psychology. A lot of guys that show up at a garage sale, all they plan on doing is looking. Oh sure, if you got a dirt cheap price on something they want, maybe then they'll buy it. But then I lay the old psychology on them. And before they know it, they're walking out of here with an armload of merchandise. Finley chuckled, psychology. I suspect you know about as much psychology as a mollusk. Well, maybe I do, maybe I don't. It just depends. Depends on what? 
on what a mollusk is. Okay, Finley, you think you're so smart. I'll just give you an example of how to send a bargain hunter into a fine frenzy. Now, the first thing you do is price everything up real high. Say about triple what you figure something is worth. That gives you a margin for haggling, should it come to that. Of course, you don't mark the prices on anything. You keep them in your head. So in comes a guy, and he's kind of sniffing over your stuff, thinking you're going to ask an arm and a leg for everything. So he picks up a nice little reel, for instance, and he figures if he haggles real hard, he can get it for maybe 10 bucks. He says, how much you asking? Well, this battered up old reel. I says, real dumb like, gosh, I don't know. How does two dollars sound? Well, his old eyeballs light up and start dancing around over the rest of my merchandise like he's finally struck the mother load of garage sales. How much you want for them snowshoes, he yells. I says, oh gosh, I guess 50 bucks would. And he yells, I'll take them. How much you want for? Before you know it, he's got a bunch of my junk. Um, merchandise, and I got all his money. See, I've suckered the poor bugger right into a bind frenzy without him even knowing it. But here's the tricky part. Every time he asks me for a price, I yawn, just like I'm so bored with the deal I can hardly stay awake. Works like a charm. Finley looked at me. Can you believe this nonsense? Buying frenzy, garage sale hype. Now I've heard it all. <clears throat> you ain't heard it all, Finley, Wretch said. There's a whole lot more, but this ain't no seminar for your personal education and how to operate a garage sale. Besides, I got work to do. Come back tomorrow and I'll give you a demonstration of buying frenzy. I may just do that, Finley said. Garage sale psychology. Ha! Yeah, me too, I said. I may come to observe your technique. I've got a bunch of junk um, used items that I wouldn't mind unload uh, selling. I find it kind of hard to believe, though, that someone would actually fall for this malarkey. <clears throat> He's out of his mind, Finley said flipping shut the lid of the tackle box and blowing the rust off his fingers. There's no way anyone old enough to be out alone without his mother would fall for any of this elbow psychology. I would, Finley suddenly nudged me in the ribs. <clears throat> Look over there on the ping pong, pong table, he whispered. That reel, it's just like the one of mine you dropped out of the boat. Your kneecap. That was a $40 reel. Now's your chance to replace it. The elbow probably wants 80 for it. Yeah, you're probably right, I said. I walked over and picked up the reel. <clears throat> How much you asking for this old beat up spinning reel, wretch? That old thing, he said, scratching his head and yawning. Oh, I don't know. How does two dollars sound? Finley chuckled all the way home. He even let me drive his car so he could concentrate on his chuckling. I can't get over the elbow and his sales psychology. Sometime I like to put on a disguise and sneak into one of his garage sales and let him try to pull that stuff on me. I could hardly contain myself when he yawned after you asked the price of the reel. Two bucks! Now, that is, if I do say so myself, a bargain. <clears throat> a real bargain. Get it? <laughs> Look, it's just exactly like my reel. I had my initials scratched on it right here, where it has the initials AF, which happens to be my initials, too. And this is my reel. Yeah, Finley, I said. I meant to mention that. You see... After I dropped a reel over the side of the boat, Wretch stripped off all his clothes and dove down and retrieved it off the bottom. 
But when I asked for it back, he claimed salvage rights. That's probably why he let us have it for two bucks, just to be nice. Thanks, by the way, for loaning me the two bucks. Don't let me forget to pay you back. We both had a good laugh over that zinger. I'm just happy to get the reel back, Finley said. Say, the snowshoes are poking me in the back of the head. <laughs> Couldn't we put them in the trunk? Nope, trunk's full. Last thing I could squeeze in was the antique tackle box. How about on top of the car? We could tie them to the ping pong table. Nah, we got too much stuff up there already. Finley started chuckling again. I can't get over the elbow in his garage sale psychology. I'll tell you one good thing about his operation, though. What's that? He takes credit cards. How to get started in bass fishing. Many people think they can start fishing for bass just any time they please and pick up the techniques as they go along. They are right, of course, but in the process they will miss many of the important nuances so important to the sport. Also, they will learn many bad habits and get themselves in embarrassing situations most of which can be avoided by following the advice set for the loan. You should first buy, note buy is an important and frequently repeated term in the bass angler's technical vocabulary, so learn to pronounce it properly. Several essential tools and materials. These are in order of importance, a hammer, saw, nails, paint, shingles, and a bunch of boards. Once you have everything assembled, begin building an addition onto your house. You will need this addition to store all your bass tackle in. Do not make the mistake of thinking you can simply keep your tackle in an extra bedroom or scattered about the living room unless you are a bachelor or wish soon to become one. Build the addition. Now that your addition is built, it is time to go tackle shopping. Go down to your local tackle shop and buy everything in sight. You will eventually end up with all of it anyway, so you might as well get it over with. Put the tackle in your new addition. If there is any left over, store it in an extra bedroom or scatter it about the living room. Among the stuff you will have bought are things called tackle boxes, which are nothing more than boxes in which to keep tackle. Do not confuse tackle boxes with tackle boxing, which is a form of combat used to decide who gets to use the last lure that is the only thing catching fish. Also, tackle boxes should not be confused with fishing tackle, an extreme maneuver used to prevent a companion from getting to the next fishing hole before you do. You will notice right away that the tackle boxes are divided up into little sections, which allow you to keep your tackle organized according to kind, size, color, etc. Pay no attention to this to the little sections. Just grab handfuls of tackle and stuff the boxes full. Since the contents of your tackle boxes will be in a big mess after your first first fishing trip anyway, this shortcut will save you a great deal of time. Millions of hours of fishing time are wasted each year by anglers needlessly organizing their tackle boxes before each trip. Don't fall into this trap. Now, once the tackle is stuffed into the boxes, you may find ends of plastic worms and lines sticking out. Clip these off. Bass fishermen, should be neat. <laughs> Next, you must begin learning the names of all the stuff you bought. Say that you happen to be the only person to catch a fish in three hours or so. Other bass anglers will pull up next to your boat and say, what did you catch it on? If you don't know the name of your lure, all you can say is something like, a little green wiggly thing. 
the other fishermen will laugh and poke fun at you while frantically sorting through their tackle boxes for little green wiggly things. It can be embarrassing. Think how much better it will be if you can reply to your inquisitors. I caught it on a Mr. Twister chartreuse flake double tail. Yes, I know it's difficult to say. That's why you must begin practicing right now. In learning the names of your tackle, you probably should start with plastic worms. Your basic worms have simple enough names. Black, purple, blue, red, etc. Eventually, though, you will want to move up to your power worms. Smoke, motor oil, black grape, and amber flake. You may think those names are more appropriate to members of a street gang than to plastic worms. The names were in fact borrowed from members of a street gang who took up bass fishing and went straight. These plastic worms are terrific fish getters. A bass will start to nibble on motor oil and amber flake will sneak up behind and mug him. It's a good idea, however, not to be caught alone in the dark with more than six of these power worms. You never know. They may claim you look like a bass. Once you have learned all the names of all your fishing tackle, which shouldn't take longer than two years, you are ready to go out on the water and start looking for bass. The first thing you will discover is that bass are very hard to see because they are covered up with water. This may strike you as taking unfair advantage, as it does me, but that is the way the contest is played. To the inexperienced eye, all water looks pretty much the same. Consequently, you will spend a great deal of time casting your lures into water in which your average bass wouldn't be caught dead. So what do you do? I recommend that you find an experienced bass fisherman to take you out and instruct you on the fine points of catching bass. My first bass mentor was a chap by the name of Wretch Sweeney. On the first day of instruction, he took me to a spot where I would never have guessed a bass might be hanging out. I'll bet you would never guess a bass would be hanging out here, he said. Well, just you cast your yellow skirt, yellow twister tail into that brush by the shore, and I'll show you something. I made 10 or 15 casts with the spinnerbait. See, Wretch said, a bass would never hang out here. Let this be a lesson to you. In this way, I quickly learned all the places in our area where not to fish for bass, and also that I had better find another bass fishing instructor. My next instructor was a man by the name of Smokey Joe. Smokey taught me a great deal about terminology, particularly what words to use when you jerk your lure off of what you think is a grasp of a submerged log, but turns out to be the grasp of a submerged bass, the size of a log. Some anglers will respond to this situation by shaking their heads and calmly commenting, Gosh, a funny thing just happened. I jerked my line because I thought I was hooked up on a log and it was the biggest bass I ever saw in my life. Well, that's the way it goes. Never again go fishing with a bass angler who responds in this way. He is not cut out for the sport and will be a bad influence on you. Smokey Joe showed me how to respond properly to the log bass situation. As he snapped the lure free and the monstrous ba bass thrashed briefly through Smokey's field of vision, he dropped his rod and reel into the boat. Then he leaned forward, grasping the gunnels with both hands, his eyeballs protruding only slightly in the direction of the empty water through which the bass had churned a moment before, as if the sheer intensity of the stare might bring the bass back. All this while, Smokey was noisily sucking air, expanding his lungs until his shirt tails were drawn right out of his gr grimy jeans. 
I then saw the reason for his gripping the gunwale, because he began to jump up and down with both feet, and his grasp on the gunwales prevented him from flying out of the boat. I recognized this as an important tip and made a mental note to remember just how it was done. He then used the air in his lungs to power a long, quavering scream of anguish that echoed up and down the lake, and for miles away, fishermen said to each other, Smokey Joe must have lost the trophy bass he thought was a log. At last, the scream dribbled out into ominous silence, and I wondered what Smokey would do next. I hoped it didn't involve me. I was relieved to see him sucking air once more, and I wondered if it was for another scream, even though I thought he had exhausted all possibilities for a scream in his first effort. But he didn't scream again. Instead, he moved into the terminology stage, employing exotic words I had never heard before, occasionally and deftly working in the terms bath and log, but they were so burdened down with adjectives it was difficult to notice them. When he reached full pitch, I figured we could have turned off the electric motor and powered the boat at trolling speed with nothing more than Smokey's torrent of terminology. At peak volume, it probably achieved 35 pounds of thrust, perhaps more. I realized then that I would need several more years of bass fishing to achieve anything comparable. When we finished fishing for the day, we pulled into the dock. Some other anglers were just going out. Any luck? One of them asked. Got a few, Smokey said. And I lost the biggest bass I ever saw in my life. Gee, that's too bad, the man said. Smokey shrugged and smiled. That's the way it goes. I knew then that there were nuances to bass fishing that I had never even suspected.